Aloha. Welcome back to the channel. My name is Lee Scott. I'm a professional nature photographer based here on Kauai. And I know it's been a long time since uh, my last video, so long time no see. Welcome back. I am happy to be with you here on YouTube and presenting a new episode with you. And this episode, I want to follow up on the Sigma 500 f 5.6 lens for L mount. I just returned from six weeks of travel, two weeks in Alaska photographing brown bears in Katmai National Park, and then four weeks in Hokkaido in northern Japan photographing the Higuma, the brown bear, Kitsune, fox, uh, Ezo Shika, the Sitka deer, a couple of Ojirawashi, the eagles, white-tailed eagles, and uh, the Blackstone Fish Owl. Now for the Blackstone Fish Owl, I used um, the Leica, Leica 90 to 280. So we're gonna save that for a different episode. This episode's all about the Leica SL3 and the SL2 in combination with the Sigma 500 f 5.6 lens. And please consider that your results may vary. All right, let's get into it. Aloha. It's hot. And it's coffee. Day like today, that's pretty much all you need. So this morning I had good success here. Um, six foxes, Kita Kitsune. One mother with two kids. They weren't babies or anything, maybe a year old but playful and as luck would have it I caught him running and I actually think that the Leica SL3 got it in focus and it might actually be sharp. So this is a good time to talk about the Leica SL3 and it's a little difficult to say definitively because I haven't seen the files on a computer, I haven't done any editing on them at all just from using it in the field and then looking at the files on the back of the LCD on the camera. However, my initial impressions are that you cannot rely on this camera to give you consistent results in a wildlife setting. If you take it out on a wildlife trip, don't take it to photograph snow leopards because you, it might <laughs> fail you mechanically no it's gonna last it's, it's it's not gonna you know poop out on you or anything like that it'll work if the batteries still have juice but the focus is so poor the response time is so slow from when it wakes from sleep to shows you anything in the viewfinder then to the focus it's really, really slow, and I just, you, you, you can't rely on it to give you consistent results. Will it give you good results? Yes. But can you say, I'm gonna take this on a trip of a lifetime where I might get one opportunity to photograph this special animal? I honestly think you'd be better with, and certainly the Z8, Nikon Z8 and, 100 to 400 or their PF lenses or if they have anything like that for the Z mount and then you know the super telephoto that's a different story those lenses are all exceptional and all exceptionally priced but um, you would do better with the Nikon Z8 and a 100 to 400 or an R5 even Mark 1 and the 100 to 500 by Canon I'm sure the Mark 2 is better in some regards to the R5 Mark I. Uh, the R3, you would catch it with the R3 also. I mean, um, it's interesting. For a camera that they say is based on user experience, the user experience of the SL3 in a wildlife setting in the field is really, really frustrating. One, the wake up time from the sleep. Two, the slow focusing you'll get a yellow box, which is maybe in focus, but it's not guaranteed in focus. And then it'll turn green, and then you'll get the green box. 
if the animal's in the grass, it's going to focus on the grass. It's going to focus on the grass, especially if there's anything in front of the animal. It's going to focus on that. So you have to change the focus uh, mood to either spot focus or a very small field focus. Move it around with a joystick, which is nice. That's, that's a good feature there. But you just can't rely on the animal tracking as it stands in the beta version right now. Okay, so that's two, two issues. Three, the battery life of this thing is atrocious. So I have the $1,000 battery grip. So I got two batteries in there. It sucks the juice like, like you wouldn't believe. So if you were using it in the field like I was in Katmai, you need four batteries a day at least. And so if you're gonna be charging if you're using four, that means you got two in and you have two either charging or fully charged, but you're gonna run out of two in the field and you're not gonna be able to charge those. So you really need five, five batteries for one day of wildlife shooting. That's absurd, okay? That's just, that's just absurd. So that goes back to number one. The battery life is so poor on this camera that you always will have it in sleep mode when you're walking around or you're not using it, which means that there's that lag time between waking from sleep to giving you something in the viewfinder to then giving you something, a focus box or whatnot for the animal. But uh, yeah, uh, one other aspect of this camera that makes it difficult for wildlife in wildlife photography, I think it's important to have a very capable backup camera. One that may be the previous model, but is still capable in terms of uh, helping you photograph with either another prime lens of telephoto nature or a telephoto zoom. So what I have as my backup is the SL2, which sucks for focusing tracking. Absolutely terrible. And so, what I'm eventually doing is, I have the SL2 as backup, but I'm just keeping my 35 millimeter prime on there because it's basically a landscape camera because it's so poor at tracking and following the animals and so slow to focus on them that it's almost better. And actually that's why I'm using it this morning, just to take off lens and change lenses on the SL3. Because even though the SL3 is poor, it's a lot better than the SL2. So, oh my gosh, think of that. Um, so I don't know how many, uh, what number I'm on the list of why my initial impression of the SL3 is, is that it's not capable for wildlife photography on a consistent basis with consistent um, results and high expectations for your photography. But, but again, hopefully I get back and throw the memory card in the computer and the files prove me wrong, but for now, that's some initial thoughts. There's one other thing that really just drove me crazy about the SL3 and wildlife. I'm shooting at four frames a second. That was my choice. I did not want to shoot at 30 frames a second or 20 frames a second. So four frames a second, great, fine, whatever. That's what it is, four frames a second. But even at four frames a second, the EVF, it doesn't black out, it blurs out. So as you're photographing a bird in flight or the Shima Fukuro, the blackstone fish owl that comes down, the wings flap and you're shooting four frames a second and then by the third shot, the EVF is blurred. And it's like, what is going on? It doesn't black out, but it blurs out. And so you actually have no idea whether or not you got it, whether or not the focus was sharp and Oftentimes it ain't. So that's one more thing that really, really drove me crazy about using the SL3 and the Sigma 500 f5.6 in a wildlife setting. Okay, back to the program. It's just not a wildlife camera at all, at all. I'm using it that way because I spent a lot of money on it and I'm trying to make it go, I'm trying to make a go of it. <laughs> but, but again, hopefully, my initial impressions will be proven wrong after I have the ability to look at the files on the computer and then edit them. Another concern that I have is the noise, the high ISO. So I was expecting to be able to shoot at 3200 with no problem at all. Looking on the LCD, reviewing the files, again, just in camera, uh, on the back of the camera, 
the noise seems pretty bad at 3200 so that's you know that's really disappointing because I was hoping that Sigma f5.6 would work at ISO levels of 3200 to 6400 because I'm shooting at 5.6 and not f4 but right now the initial impression is that um, it's just it's just not going to be good enough so you know in all honesty I'm going to have to look at something uh, either Canon or Nikon maybe Sony I don't know I don't think so there's just too many buttons on a Sony it's just yeah it's a little disappointing right now after four weeks of using it two weeks in Alaska and then two weeks here um, now I do think I've gotten some good shots but not uh, the same number as I would have and again for example, this morning, if I wouldn't have seen six foxes, if I had only seen two, those first two encounters, you know, I failed myself, right? Because I'm the photographer, I'm holding the camera, I made the choice on this camera. I can't put all the blame on the camera. That's unfair. So I failed myself as a photographer, as a wildlife photographer out here. And with wildlife photography, you just have to give yourself the best opportunity for success that you absolutely possibly can. And in all honesty, I thought I was good enough. Let's just, let's, let's say that too. I thought I was good enough to use the slower autofocus system of the Leica, the slower and inexact and poor autofocus tracking of the Leicas with the wildlife. But the truth is, I'm not that good. I need help from the camera. Everything's gonna be alright I see that you've been crying You know I'm always on your side Everything's gonna be alright I see that you've been crying You know I'm When I thought about presenting the review, I had great trepidation in how I should uh, present my thoughts because it's very difficult to review the lens independent of the camera system because of course in the field they're working as one. What follows is uh, the review of the Leica SL3 in combination with the Sigma 500 f5.6 and again your results may vary. Just as my uh, live impressions from Notescape Peninsula indicate, there are some major challenges with using the Leica SL3 for wildlife photography. Number one, first and foremost, without a doubt, is the autofocus. The autofocus is poor. There's no way to sugarcoat it. The animal tracking is inadequate. The inability of the camera to lock in to the eye results in photos that appear sharp at first glance, but once you look into it a bit more, they're not. You're already shooting at an aperture of f5.6. To stop down doesn't really help much in overall sharpness, but it does certainly limit the amount of light that's going to come in. In most cases over the six week period of shooting, and I was photographing nearly every single day, I was shooting at 5.6. There were opportunities to stop down to around 6.3 or 7.1, in some cases even 8, but most of the time I was shooting at 5.6. 5.6 aperture, it's not bad, especially considering all the advantages the size of the lens, the weight of the lens, the ability to hand hold this lens, the portability of the lens. However, the lens itself was not holding me back. I feel it was like SL3. The animal tracking in its beta form is unusable for a professional. I can't say it any other way. I wish it were different. So, I, the autofocus, again, major, major challenge. The speed of the autofocus, the responsiveness of the autofocus to the animal's movement, and the inability of the autofocus to deal with obstructions. Now, I did get into uh, the custom modes within the autofocus to try to set the parameters to be more responsive and also to track a little stickier, and it all 
failed. It just didn't work to any avail. The only workarounds that I have for the poor autofocus performance of the SL3 with the Sigma 500 f5.6 lens. Workarounds on focus mode. So there are times when you must abandon the beta version animal tracking focus mode. There is a button set up uh, on the Leica SL3. It's the second button uh, on the front of the camera. You have that button and you press that button and then that immediately gives you the opportunity to change the focus modes. And then with your thumb, you just floop, slide through. And I was using uh, spot focus, which is basically a very teeny tiny crosshair. And then using the joystick to put that onto where the animal you want it to be. Then if that was a little too fine, then you would use the field focus. The difficulty with this was even though the lens is small, there is going to be some camera shake and whatnot. And I didn't really find that the image stabilization was as good as say my Leica 90 to 280. In fairness, the shooting conditions that I encountered both in Alaska and Hokkaido were not ideal. I had a lot of rain, a lot of fog, a lot of mist, a lot of overcast days, animals in the forest, and so it was dark. So there are challenges on the autofocus system just from the shooting environment in conjunction with the aperture of f5.6. Autofocus will always be a bit snappier and faster with a faster lens. More light comes in and that helps the autofocus locate the animal and track the animal. So that's something to consider. When I gave the initial impressions review and went out and tested the rented copy that I had, I had near perfect conditions of beautiful sunlight shining over my shoulder, front light on nearly every bird that I photographed. And in Hokkaido and Alaska on this trip of the six weeks, it was rare that I had those conditions. You'll have to be aware, change that focus mode, okay? Look for the clean background, okay? That will also help the autofocus locate and track the animal. A cluttered background, the animal is gonna get lost in there, okay? The autofocus is gonna hit a tree, hit a thicket, hit the grass. So you really need to pay particular attention to the background. The cleaner the background, the better. The more distant the background, the better. The truth is with wildlife photography, we are playing the animal's game. They make the rules, they keep the clock, and they keep score. When they say it's done, it's done. When they say they're not coming out to a clear area, they're not coming out to a clear area. If they're not coming out to the light, they're not coming out to the light. We can do what we can, but in wildlife photography, it's very, very rare that you get ideal conditions in which to shoot in. Now, the second major challenge that I found and using the Leica SL3, and I firmly believe this has nothing to do with the Sigma 500 f5.6 lens, is the slow response time and the interminable lag time from sleep to wake mode. The time that it takes for this camera to come on and then set the lens up, get it ready, and then give you something in the viewfinder, and then a green box of focus, is frustrating to say the least. You will miss shots because of this. If you are in a blind, you must have the camera open and ready all the time, which means burning battery power. If you're walking around, you must have the camera on all the time or train yourself to turn on the camera by pressing the shutter as you raise the camera up, okay? Because if you wait until you get the camera to your face, to your eye, before you press the shutter, you will be looking at black for what feels like three seconds. It may not necessarily be that long, but it's gonna feel like forever. And instead of photographing that bear looking at you, it's gonna be looking down the road. Or in many cases, it might even be the difference between the bear's eye and the bear's butt. It's so significant. That is something that the only workaround that I know of is either to keep the camera turned on, which is gonna burn a lot of battery, right when you see the animal or sense the animal, hear the animal, you have to press that shutter button before you raise it up to your eye. Just half press, get it, warmed up and ready. So hopefully by the time you get it to your face, 
you'll have something to look at in the viewfinder. The other challenge that I mentioned, the blurred out viewfinder, I've given a rant about that. There's no, no need to talk about that anymore. So these are the, some of the limitations and then also of course the aperture of uh, f5.6 which is not bad but for me that is uh, that's a limitation. I prefer brighter aperture lenses and I think that will also help with the autofocus and again I do feel that the Leica 90 to 280 had a little better autofocus performance, a little snappier. Um, it still wasn't great, but I do think it was better than the Sigma 500 f5.6. And I also feel that the image stabilization of the Leica body and the Leica lens was better than the image stabilization on the Sigma. Yeah. Enough about the bad stuff. Let's talk about the good. In the live review video from Notesky, I talked about my reluctance to shoot at high ISOs. And initially I set the camera up in my wildlife setting, which is a very good uh, attribute of the Leica. That is one of the things I love are the custom profile. So I have a wildlife custom profile, a landscape, seascape, a black and white, a people, and a pano custom profile set up. So wonderful. So that's a really good feature that the Leica does have. Now, with that uh, wildlife profile, I set up a, a floating ISO and auto ISO. The auto ISO I capped at 3200 with my reluctance to go above that. And reviewing the photos on the back of the LCD on camera, it appeared that there was a lot of noise. Now, in fact, once I get it back to the computer, the noise really wasn't significant, especially at 3200. So, in uh, shooting, as I became a little more frustrated with using the f5.6 aperture, which necessitated slower shutter speeds and or higher ISOs, I, mean, I overcame my reluctance to shoot at higher ISOs and I just changed the uh, automatic ISO setting and maxed it out at 5000. When I was shooting the Shima Fukuro, the Blackstone Fish Owl, I even raised it to 8000. If you have great confidence in the ISO capabilities, high ISO capabilities of your camera, raise it. I believe that a strength of the Leica SL3 from using it in the field to now going back and looking at the files is indeed its high ISO capabilities and the way in which it deals with noise but also recovering detail in the shadow. Initially, I capped it at 3200, but eventually I was shooting at 4000 and 5000 ISO, and that really made a big difference in the images that I was able to take. I was able to raise that shutter speed just a bit, which uh, really made the difference between getting a photo and not getting a photo, because many of the images that I got, especially in Hokkaido, the animals in the forest. It's dark, it's rainy, it's cloudy, it's overcast, and then the animals in the forest, and you know, evening comes on at 4.30. So shooting at higher ISOs was really beneficial. And what we can do, we can look at a couple of images that I took at ISO 3200, 4000, 5000, and 8000, and we'll, we'll see how they are. high ISO images, I think 4,000 to 5,000 is likely the sweet spot for the low light scenarios. And of course, the rarity of the encounter will likely determine our ISO levels. If we're shooting a bear and we know we're gonna see a bear tomorrow in Katmai National Park, and we know we're gonna see another bear on the next day, then we're gonna wait for those better opportunities. 
However, if a Wolverine comes out and it's a little dark or it's low light, we're going to raise that ISO to 12,800 or even 24,000, whatever it takes to get that Wolverine. And if a unicorn comes out, oh my gosh, no limits, right? So that's just something that we're going to have to be realistic about and approach in the field. After all of this, we finally have to discuss the image quality. The image quality is only an applicable discussion if the autofocus works or if the manual focus and the photographer are able to nail the focus. You can't sharpen an autofocus image. They have Topaz AI Sharpen or Sharpen AI, but it's kind of a gimmick and it doesn't really work, I don't think. And basically, if it's out of focus, you're done. It's a throwaway. You know, throw it away. If it's out of focus, don't try. Just, just delete that, okay? The challenge in discussing the image quality is the frustrations of the misses, but the beauty in the hits which is to say the image quality of the Leica SL3 with the Sigma 500 f5.6 is outstanding when you get it. Perhaps this combination is a best case scenario or a best conditions setup. Good light, good background, but when you get it, it is beautiful. And then when we talk about recovering shadow details and whatnot, the color as well, the color of the Leica, the auto white balance is maybe a little too magenta for me. I'll tone that down a bit. Uh, but the color of this lens combination with the Leica SL3 and SL2 is also outstanding. When you get it, when you and the camera hit focus, the image quality is wonderful. Very, very pleasing. Action. Now, as you guys know, you never really know until you put it on the computer. Looking in the back of the camera is one thing, putting on the computer is another, throwing some edits on it is yet another. However, I always say it is not a photo until it's printed. So that's what we've done. We've printed out a couple. This is a 12 by 18. This is Hanamula Fine Art Barita Satin. And everything looks really, really good. I could maybe darken the background a bit, but everything just looks fantastic on this print. And this one was at ISO 4,000. I mean, this looks really, really good. I'm, I'm down with this for sure. Okay, so that's one of the Higuma, Japanese brown bear. Now let's look at another. This one is on Moab Slick Rock metallic paper. ISO of 5,000. No issues at all, man. I mean, you see something like this? Let's try to get you a little better view here. Come in from the side, maybe. Just gorgeous. What about if I hold it here? What do we got there? Okay, big light. Again, this is ISO 5000. I am not seeing any noise artifacts at all. I took it through Topaz D-Noise and it looks fantastic. That little bear cub are absolute just... bangers. Now we have the Blackstone Fish Owl, one of the rarest owls in the world. This is also on Moab Metallic Slick Rock Paper. ISO 8000. I did put topaz denoise on this, but ISO of 8000 and still sharp, 12 by 18 inch print. Even in this black section, which I didn't really want to pull out too much because it is a nighttime scene, but wow. 
So image quality, when it hits, when you hit, when I, as the photographer, do my job, five out of five, 10 out of 10, bangers, for sure. However, I don't think for wildlife photography, the benefits of the high ISO, the shadow recovery detail, or the ability to recover detail in the shadows, and that image quality on the few hits that you get, I don't think those benefits supersede the faults. So ultimately, the Leica SL3 and Sigma 500 f5.6, I cannot recommend for wildlife photography. In my opinion, the Leica SL3 autofocus is not professional standard. And I don't even think you should use it on a hobbyist or amateur level. If your heart is set on using Leica, then the Leica SL3 is certainly better than the SL2, and I imagine it's miles better than the SL. But for wildlife photography and serious enjoyment, let's just talk about that. The enjoyment of being in nature and photographing these beautiful animals and in turn communicating the beauty of these animals to others. I just don't think the Leica SL3 and Sigma 500 f5.6 can do that on a consistent basis. When you are on safari, it's a trip of a lifetime. You want a camera and autofocus system to give you the best chance of success that you possibly can. Gone are the days when a sharp shoulder and soft face are usable. Maybe 10 years ago, a sharp nose and soft eyes, we could get a cell out of. Maybe a magazine insert, not the cover, but maybe something inside the magazine perhaps. But the ubiquity of the iPhone, the Samsung, and the Google has made photographing animals in their natural landscape something that has become even more challenging because now the ubiquity of the iPhone and the ubiquity of excellent camera gear has made those shots relatively easy. Getting to the location may be difficult. Finding the animal may be difficult, but getting sharp images of these animals, we can all do that now. So what is it that we're looking for? interesting and unique animal behavior, interaction of animal and landscape, animal with amazing, beautiful light, and perhaps an interaction of species. These special moments is what we now need to communicate as a professional photographer or high amateur. And let's be honest, if you're spending money on a Leica SL3, then you need to be high amateur or certainly, um, enjoy your photography to a very high degree. And I just don't think this combination allows me to enjoy the wildlife photography in the same way as I would if I were using a camera with a better autofocus system, more consistent autofocus system, a camera that wakes faster, and a camera with a brighter lens combination. So what am I to do? The responsible human in me says, sell all the Leica gear and invest in something different. However, the photographer in me says, the Leica is really good for landscape. The Leica is exceptional for seascape. The Leica lenses that I have are fantastic. However, it's not a wildlife camera. I wish it were different, but it's just simply not a wildlife camera. So I'm left with a decision to buy a wildlife camera and lens from Sony Nikon Canon. And what I've done, I've pre-ordered the Canon R1. I'll wait until that comes and then hopefully we'll get a 200-500 or maybe the 100-300 to if uh, the 200-500 is not ready or if it's just not released. And I'll be a dual shooter for a little while anyway, and we'll see how that goes. Because the Leica certainly has benefits that I see when I am shooting landscape and seascape, but just, just not for wildlife. So that's where I'm at. 
the Sigma 500 f 5.6 lens. I sold it. Uh, it's not necessarily an indictment of the lens itself, but more my frustrations with the Leica SL3 system in shooting wildlife. And ultimately, I enjoy wildlife photography too much to be out there with a camera that is frustrating to use. This lens helped me out tremendously over the six weeks that I used it. So after six weeks of extensive use, the review of this lens is that portability, five out of five. Size form factor, five out of five. Aperture of 5.6, which necessitates higher ISO or lower shutter speeds. Please consider your taste for high ISO noise artifacts in the final image and the capabilities of the camera that you're going to pair with this lens. Image stabilization of the lens in conjunction with the SL3, I'm going to give it three out of five. I just didn't think it was there. Just didn't, didn't do it for me, which was a surprise. Durability, five out of five, all of those things, five out of five. Sharpness, when the subject is near, sharp, five out of five. When the subject's a little distant, it's not quite as sharp. And I don't know if that's the lens or if that's the Leica, but yeah. I think it's an excellent lens, but uh, the Leica SL3 is not excellent for wildlife, so, so there we are. Okay, let me know your ideas in the comments section and uh, let me know your experiences with this lens in combination with the Leica SL3. If, if anything that I've said, if you think that, um, that you, you just don't agree with or you think it's bogus or if you've had similar results or ways that you've worked around uh, the frustrations and complications that you've had uh, with uh, the Leica and wildlife and especially in conjunction with this lens. Again, your results may vary, uh, and I hope you did find this review useful. And I know it's been a while since uh, my last video, so thank you for sticking with me on this one, and thanks for sticking with the channel. We have a lot of variety coming up. Videos from Hokkaido, from Alaska, camping in Hokkaido, travel photography in Hokkaido, and even selling my FJ Cruiser through the Kelly Blue Book Instant Cash Offer. If you want a video on that, I'll be happy to do one of those too. Okay, uh, thanks so much for sticking with me. And uh, again, I hope you found this video useful and uh, best of luck to you. And please, please let me know in the comments section uh, your ideas of the Leica SL3, uh, it's in particular for wildlife photography or even for landscape seascape and the results that you've had with the Sigma 500 f 5.6 and your camera uh, system of choice, whether it be Sony or Panasonic or the Leica. All right, uh, thanks so much and uh, mahalo, aloha. All right, real talk with Uncle Lee here. So I just had two successive uh, fox encounters here in Akan Mashu National Park. And uh, he's still running around. Okay, I'm gonna go out and try to catch him. Okay, I'm gonna walk on the road, try to catch this guy. He's a little one. And I will admit, it is a very, very difficult shooting environment. Shooting with uh, 5.6 lens. Okay, he's on the tree there. Got field focus. Snapping off a couple shots of 1 320th, 1 320th of a second. I'm going to try to find a spot where he's going to run on the log and I can catch him unobscured. And I'm using field focus because the Leica animal focus will jump to any of these trees and stuff because it's just not very good. And catch him here, okay, 1 320th, 1 400th, minus 2 thirds exposure, that's fine. Snap him here right when he looks up at us. I'm even gonna to move to spot focus and just put it right on him so it doesn't jump to a tree in front or behind. Even as it is, the combination of this Sigma with Leica SL3, the image stabilization is enough to snuff. I got it on his eye and then I move a little bit 
and just right now it, it focused on the thicket behind him, not the fox. Should be right on his eye there. Now we'll put it to animal tracking. Okay, it shows green box around him. So it shows that we have him. One four hundredth of a second, F5.6. The ISO is 3200. Okay, we're gonna to try to catch him to walk just a little bit more and we have an open spot in the trees. Okay, we still have the green box around him. I'm not super confident that it'll catch him. I think it'll catch the tree in front of him. Yep, yep, it did. It caught the tree in front of him. I'm telling you guys, so this is real talk with Uncle Lee. So much time and money to get out to where the animals are. And you want to be confident that you're going to come back with some shots. But that's, that's, that's real talk with Uncle Lee. This is not after editing the photos. This is not after some topaz denoise. This is not after any of that, this is in the field perception and my true, true feeling. Like just now, I'm shooting in between two trees using these big trees for blocking and it just jumped from the fox right to the tree on like the fifth shot. And you wanna talk about frustrating? You know? Not to mention the 5.6 aperture. You know, when I'm, there's a huge difference guys between 5.6 and F4. Uh, and then don't even, you know, talk about 2.8. So in the future, I just need, I'm gonna see who's got a 500. See who's got a 500 F4. And whether it be Nikon, I might jump to Nikon, get the Z8 or Canon R5 Mark II. If they ever come out with the 500, I don't like the 100 to 500. I'm doing all I can sitting down here on the pavement and he's on the tree just need to look up at me there we go got a little glint in the eye there let's see check the screen that one looks pretty good that, you know that one's all right so the thing is you'll get a couple and you're like oh this camera works but then it's just so frustrating on so many other occasions. So that's uh, fox hunting in Akan Mashu National Park, Eastern Hokkaido, Japan. Real talk with Uncle Lee on the SL3 and wildlife photography. You'll get some shots, but you're gonna miss a lot. And it's likely you're gonna miss a lot more than you get. And that's not what we want as wildlife photographers. All right, heading to the onsen. Woohoo!